Okay, I think I'll start since it's seven o'clock. Um, welcome everyone. I don't know if you can see me or just see Jennifer's shared screen, but welcome. Um, my name is Rachel Garcia. I'm an adult services librarian here at Wilmette Public Library. Um, this is a very special program. It's kind of um, one of the first programs as part of our Stories of Exile series that we're putting on this fall. Um, that series is the result of a grant that we were awarded by the Yiddish Book Center um, to um, discuss Yiddish literature as a lens um, to reflect upon the experience of exile, displacement, and migration um, shared across cultures and communities throughout history. Um, Jennifer Young is the um, education program manager at the Yiddish Book Center, and she agreed to come and give us a virtual tour of the Yiddish Book Center. Um, I went to visit in blizzardy January of this year um, as part of the grant. We all, the librarians involved had a workshop and it was just an amazing place to visit um, and learn about and it has such a great story. So um, yes, Jennifer is here tonight to talk to us about that. I'm just gonna um, give Jennifer's bio and then we'll jump into it. Um, Jennifer served, um, in addition to the, being the education program manager at the Yiddish Book Center currently, she's also served as the director of education at the YIVO Institute, um, where she also worked as digital learning curator to produce YIVO's first online class, Discovering Ashkenaz. She has also worked at the Tenement Museum, the Lower East Side Jewish Conservancy, and the New York Historical Society. Um, she received her BA in Anthropology and Jewish Studies from McGill University and an MA in Anthropology from the University of Illinois. After completing doctoral studies in Jewish history at NYU, she received a Master in Education, Museum Curriculum and Pedagogy from the University of British Columbia. She also serves as part of a scholars working group dedicated to research and scholarship of the Yiddish left, sponsored by Cornell University. Um, and you'll learn all about the Yiddish Book Center tonight, but it is a nonprofit organization and it works to recover, celebrate, and regenerate Yiddish and modern Jewish literature and culture, um, in addition to lots of other things. Um, and then just a short plug for the rest of our events in the series. Um, we have our first book discussion um, of the series on October 17th. Um, on the landing stories by Yenta Mosh. And it's actually gonna be led by Dr. Kurzain who wrote the afterword for the book. And we're really lucky she lives in Chicago and she's gonna travel to the library to give us some context for the book and lead a discussion. So we're very lucky to have her for that. Um, and then we'll have three more discussions throughout November and into early December. And you can visit the library's website um, we have a page dedicated to the series, so you can see all the events there. You can register on the website, um, or you can call us and we can register for you. We're very happy to do that. Um, so uh, also there is Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So you can submit a question to Jennifer at any point um, during the presentation, and then we're gonna leave some time at the end and go through those. So I think I'm done with my spiel. And I'll pass um, it on to you, Jennifer, to um, take us on the tour. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Shalom Aleichem. Thanks for joining us this evening. This is so fun. I'm so glad to be here. And I have to put in a personal plug for uh, my colleague and friend, uh, Jessica Kurzine. Um, So if you get a chance to go uh, hear her in person, you really should, because she's a wonderful and engaging and very warm speaker. And I know she's very excited to get the opportunity um, to be with you all in person. So welcome to your virtual tour of the Yiddish Book Center. Um, we're gonna do a couple of different things here tonight. Um, so first of all, um, let me play for you the video that you would find in our orientation center um, if you come to the center itself. And that will sort of get you in the mood. It will sort of immerse you in the world that we live in and work in um, at the center every day. And from there, we'll sort of go back out and talk a little bit more about the contemporary mission of the center and what we're doing every day. Um, and then we're gonna go underground and take you into the vault, 
where all of our rare books are stored. And a couple of our fellows, bibliography fellows, are going to um, do a video tour of the vault for you. And then we'll come back out um, and do the macro, bigger picture. What are all the things that you've always wanted to ask about Yiddish? Um, and then we'll just chat and have questions. So I'm very excited to do all of that with you. Um, and Rachel, obviously, let me know if there's any technical problems or you can't hear anything, and I will do my best to fix it. Yiddish was a spoken language of roughly three quarters of the world's Jews for the past thousand years. Books were our portable homeland. Books define our national identity. We call ourselves Am HaSefir, the people of the book. And yet here were books being destroyed. I first came up with this idea to go rescue the world's Yiddish books. The response everywhere was essentially the same. Don't you know Yiddish is dead? Don't you know no one cares about this culture any longer? Why don't we give you a nice scholarship and you can go off and study in Israel? What do you have to waste your time with these old books that nobody wants? In those days, they said that, well, all of Yiddish literature was out of print. If you wanted to find an out-of-print Yiddish book, you could go to an obscure book dealer in Amsterdam, or else you might find it in a garbage can in Brooklyn, and there wasn't too much in between. First of all, you have to understand, I was 23 years old when all this uh, came about. I was studying Yiddish literature. Probably would have gone on to a very conventional academic career were it not for this one very basic problem. There were no books to read. Each week, our professor would assign us, oh, I don't know, a novel by any of dozens of major Yiddish writers. So right after class, one of us would race off and be the first one to get to the Jewish public library and find a copy of the book. But for the rest of us, there were no books to be had. So I started putting up notices, you know, little signs on the Jewish delicatessen and the laundromat in the old Jewish neighborhood saying, I'm a young graduate student, I'm looking for Yiddish books. So before I knew it, people were calling up boxes of books are piled high and my apartment is overflowing with piles and piles and piles of Yiddish books. And it was somewhere along that point I got a phone call from my parents and they said, Aaron, I think you have to come home because the rabbi's given us so many books we're afraid the second story of the house is about to collapse. And I think it was just about that moment that the Yiddish Book Center was born. Well, I had no clue what the actual work of going around and collecting Yiddish books really entailed. Along with all these boxes of books came letters and postcards uh, from older Jews who would write and say, I have many books to give you, but I'm too old or I'm too infirm or there are just too many books. You're going to have to come and get them. So in mid-July of 1980, I set out on my very first collection trip. I had received a postcard which came from an elderly man, and I, I knew already how old he was because it was a penny postcard which came postage due. So he writes in this very scratchy handwriting, he said, I'm a very old man, I am leaving on a trip to Israel, I'm afraid that I might not return, and if I don't, I'm afraid they will throw away my books, will you please help me? I show up at noon, and in this tiny one-room apartment, all there was was a little 
small bed. There was a metal table with a hot plate and a million bottles of medicine. And other than that, the apartment was full of boxes and piles of both Yiddish and Hebrew books. Well, I figured, all right, you take the books, you put them on the hand truck, you roll them out to the truck, fire ticket, and you move on to the next stop. Uh, it wasn't to be. He sat me down at the table. He says, oh, no, no. He says, Jungerman, young man, which became sort of my generic name in the Yiddish world. He says, Jungerman, he says, I first have to tell you about each of these books. He began handing me every one of these books, one volume at a time. He says, this book here, my wife and I, we bought in 1927. We went without lunch for a week. We should be able to afford it. And this book, have you read this book? Sit down right now, look at this book. It went on for hours and hours and hours. I'm so far behind schedule. At this point, I finally have his books in the truck. I'm about to drive off, and he says, and Manut Jungerman, he says, Vehin Leifste, where are you running to? I said, where am I running? I said, I have other stops to make. I'm already behind schedule. He says, oh, he says, if I state in this, you don't understand, he said. And he explained that when he received my telegram, he told all the other people in the building that I was coming. He said, they all have books for you. Let's get to work. I look up. It's like this 12-story high-rise building. I said, all the people have books. I said, that's right, they all have books. Let's start going. We walk into the building. He knocks on every door. People come up with shopping bags and boxes, suitcases even, full of books for me. And of course, what do you think you have to do at every single apartment? They bring you inside. They sit you down at the table. They make a glass of tea. They get the Entenmann cakes come out of the box and the Lux and Kiglach that have been waiting all day come out of the oven. And they feed me and they tell me the story of their books as well. Here I am, 23 years old, you know, in jeans and a t-shirt, but somehow it's fallen on me to try to pick up the fragments of this world and save them for the future. Because when people give you their books, it's a very candid moment in their lives. They're handing you the treasures they've accumulated in their lifetime, and they know their own children and their own grandchildren don't want. Invariably, they're crying. Uh, they tell stories with a candor that would probably be very rare in their lives. So it's a very special moment. There was a sort of emotional uh, understanding that that when people hand you their books, as they say to you, "Younger man, what is my Yerusha? Here is my inheritance. This is what I am leaving to the world." What they're leaving to you is a world that is very fast vanishing. It was a world that was shattered in the Holocaust. It was a world that simply vanished under the pressures of assimilation. These were the people who themselves had created a new world. And it was a new world in which very few people were now interested. And so here we were. Uh, they had so much to tell us. There was a sort of understanding that what was happening was a moment in history. I mean, I knew that from the very first trip, and I never forgot that, and I have not forgotten it 21 years later. Early on, it became apparent there was no way that a handful of young people were going to be able to, you know, round up thousands of what turned out to be hundreds of thousands of Yiddish books. So we organized a network of what we called Zomlers, or volunteer book collectors. The idea went way back to the early years of the 20th century, when Jewish historians of Eastern Europe had called for a network of these Zomlers, or volunteer collectors, to round up communal records. It's been an enormously emotional experience for us our encounters with the Zomlers over the years. For them, this was really, it was cultural preservation. It was saving their own lives and their own life stories. So they had a real urgency in what they were doing. I think the real question, though, is how come so many people care about dusty old Yiddish books they can't read in the first place?
when uh, my mother's mother came to America. She was carrying with her a valise in which she had everything she had brought with her from the old country. Her older brother met her and took the suitcase and he flung it overboard. Her photographs of her parents, her clothing, uh, her Shabbos candlesticks, everything she had with her was thrown out. He understood that the price of admission to America was to throw the old country away. But I think for my generation, I am finally secure enough in my Americanism that I can now go back and I can dredge the harbor and I can find the suitcase that was thrown out. In the beginning, I was literally hitchhiking from city to city. Every time I would speak, five people, 10 people, 15 people would sign up as members. So that today, the Book Center is supported by over 30,000 members. They're one of the largest Jewish cultural organizations in the country. We have this wonderful building. It gives to Yiddish what we call in Yiddish an address which in Yiddish means a little more than an address. It means it gives it a place in the world. I will never forget when I stood there that first night after we'd finally moved into the building. Yiddish had finally found a home. But the next challenge was how do you interpret that literature for the 99% of the visitors who can't read those books in the original. So we organize educational programs. We're doing exhibitions. And of course, we have the core of books. We've augmented or established collections of Yiddish literature at 450 major university and research libraries in 26 countries around the world. And then in the summertime, we have groups of student interns who come. We teach them Yiddish in the morning, and they spend the rest of their day going through these boxes in unvarying treasures. Now that we don't have to worry about the physical preservation of the literature, we have a much bigger worry. Today, the challenge is how do you open up the books and share the culture with a broader world? And for that, the work's just begun. Okay, I hope everyone enjoyed that video. Hope you could hear it and see it pretty clearly. So that was the founding of the Yiddish Book Center by Aaron Lansky. And uh, we moved into our current location in uh, the mid 90s. And we're located right on the edge of Hampshire College, where Aaron was uh, went to college. And it's an incredibly gorgeous location. I'm just so thrilled to go to work every day because we're located in a 100-year-old apple orchard with a view of the Mount Holyoke range of mountains. Um, and Hampshire College um, sold us the land and um, was interested in developing other cultural organizations in the area um, to, to be part of a sort of a cultural village surrounding Hampshire College. And so our nearest neighbor is actually the Eric Carl Museum of Children's Picture Book Art, which is a fabulous museum. Um, and we occasionally do collaborate with them and I'm hoping to do more um, because it's really an, an exciting opportunity to work with amazing artists and writers um, and kids. And it gives a sort of nice little weird funky vibe out here in, in Western Mass to have all of these you know, cultural institutions together. Um, so I hope that's that's the beginning of my pitch of why you should come visit us in person. So I hope you're you're getting the idea. So when you walk up to the Yiddish Book Center, um, it's not going to look like anything you've 
seen architecturally in America, in North America. Um, and there's a good reason for that because the building was designed by Alan Moore, who is an architect, not Jewish, didn't know anything about Jewish architecture, um, but he was very interested in just immersing himself in the vernacular architecture of small town Eastern Europe, um, particularly the shuttles, <coughs> excuse me, the Jewish small towns and small cities where um, this kind of um, combination of Jewish and non-Jewish communities live together. And so the architecture of the Yiddish Book Center um, can't be found anywhere else in North America. Um, and mostly it's hard to find in Eastern Europe as well because this kind of um, small town architecture that was made of wood, um, these buildings were mostly destroyed during the, the Nazi onslaught. Um, but you can visit the Pauline Museum in Warsaw where you can see a couple of different examples of these kind of buildings, particularly a synagogue that they've reconstructed inside the museum, inside and out, and you really get a sense of what it would have been like to, to live it at, at the same time as, as with these amazing buildings. So you can see this architecture is wooden. They've got all these gables. They call this like the, the stacked gables. So you have the two roofs kind of on top of each other and all these shingles. And it's very simple um, kind of folksy. Um, and very kind of broken up into a sort of small um, enclosed space. And, you know, that's a deliberate architectural choice because when you walk inside, it's totally different. So you can see that contrast in that juxtaposition between dark and light and kind of maybe cold and warm and sort of small and enclosed and, um, and just open. And so when you walk into the Yiddish Book Center, it's all one big space and we've got huge windows and skylights and banners hanging from the ceilings, the high ceilings. And it's really about a place of light and warmth and culture and vivacity and uh, a living culture, not, not a library or a monument. Because the books on the shelves here are actually for sale. Um, so you can come down into our repository and you walk down the steps and you can pull any number of hundreds of thousands of different Yiddish books off the shelf and you can read them and you can buy them and you can take them home. And since Aaron and his Zomblers first started collecting books in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, we've now recovered well over one and a half million individual volumes of Yiddish books. Um, it's probably much closer to two million now. Um, and these books came from all over the world because the Yiddish diaspora is grand. Um, and and huge scales. So we're talking about you know books that um, were published or read or written in South Africa, Australia, Argentina, uh, Chile, Zimbabwe, Brazil, uh, Canada, U.S., you know Moscow, Berlin, London, Paris. Um, we have Yiddish books that were published in all of those places um, or were. Um, loved and read in all of those places and then eventually found their way to the Yiddish Book Center. So people still ask us, are we still getting books? Can there be that many Yiddish books in the world? And the answer is yes, Avada, yeah. We still get on average 200 books a week donated to the Yiddish Book Center. Um, but I'm told that at the beginning of the, the COVID pandemic in 2020 and 2021, it was a lot more than that because people were relocating um, or having time to, to pack up their attics. And, uh, and so we got a lot of books. In fact, there's a, the, what we call the great hall that we use for concerts and weddings and things. When um, I started working there at the end of 2021, it was just packed with books. Um, and they had to put a call out for volunteers to, um, to help us um, process um, all of those books. So we knew um, what we had and, and what treasures awaited us. So mostly these books come from individuals, they come from families, they come from people who passed away. Sometimes a lot of the time they come from scholars who've amassed their own personal Yiddish libraries, um, but often they also come from um, places like uh, Jewish seminaries or Jewish libraries or Jewish community centers or synagogues um, that have their own Yiddish book collection that's been added to kind of haphazardly over the years. And then at a certain point they run out of space um, and they send those books to us. And the good news is we don't keep them for very long um, because we also have a lot of 
um, libraries and other institutions that really want those Yiddish books. And so once we've processed them and cataloged them and have a sense of what we have, we're able to send them back out the door. Um, a lot of the time they go back to Eastern Europe, interestingly, because as particularly Poland these days um, has is doing a real academic boom in Jewish studies and is opening a lot more programs and departments. And there's a lot of scholars um, and people who are teaching Yiddish literature and so they're eager for those Yiddish books. So there's really a full circle happening there with, with Yiddish literature. And we're busy all year round. We don't just um, you know, receive and redistribute books. Um, we give public tours um, two or three times a week and we have weekend programs. We have one coming up in December. Uh, we have an annual music festival, Yidstock, which is a really good, fun week full of music and culture and dancing and singing. Um, but most importantly for me as an educator, we run educational programs. Um, so it starts with uh, teens. So we have field trips from uh, local schools, community centers, synagogues, things like that. Um, and we also have teens that apply to be part of our Great Jewish Book Summer Program. So uh, high schoolers come for a week and are surrounded by amazing scholars and immersed in great Jewish literature. And a lot of those teens then go on to attend our Steiner summer program in Yiddish language, which is seven weeks. The students stay in dorms at Hampshire College and learn a pretty fluent Yiddish by the end of the program. It's, it's pretty amazing. And then some of those students then reapply to become post-college fellows and live here for a year or two and work um, in the bibliography department processing Yiddish books and then working on their own research projects. Um, and we also have a translation program so people can apply to be a translation fellow and to choose a work of Yiddish literature that's never been translated before and they get funding um, and mentors that will help them translate the book. And then when it's translated, um, they can get a grant to either go to a major publishing house or to publish it with the Yiddish Book Center's in-house press, which is called White Goat Press. Um, and we also do all kinds of college programs. I just ran a program for rabbis and other Jewish clergy. Um, we have um, programs for high school teachers, for Jewish day school teachers, for all kinds of community leaders. And we also run online classes. And that's really one of the funnest projects that I get to work on. We have an online class starting um, in a couple of weeks and I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but there's Yiddish language programming and there's Yiddish culture programming and that the Yiddish culture programming is all in English. And so it's really meant to be for everyone, anyone who's ever been interested in Yiddish for even a minute. Um, and if you're really excited about accessing Yiddish books um, in your very own home, you can go to our digital library through our website and we've digitized tens of thousands of Yiddish books that are available at the um, at a click. Um, just just go to the Yiddish Book Center and type in um, the name of a book or a writer's name or even a, a concept that you're interested in researching, and you can find just hundreds of different examples. It's for scholars. It's like a candy store. It's really fantastic. And uh, now we're going to move from the repository, so the main floor, uh, to the downstairs. So we're gonna walk past the cubicles um, where I work and where the fellows work. And we're gonna go through the big, heavy metal uh, double doors. And you'll notice that the temperature is dropping. It's getting cold. And we're gonna slam the big metal door behind you. And now you're inside our vault. And this is where we keep all of our special collections. And two of our fellows made videos giving us a special insider's view of of the vault and we're going to watch those videos now. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah and I'm Emily and we're the Bibliography Fellows. We're so excited to show you around our rare books vault. Let's look inside. So now we're inside our rare books vault. This is where we keep our rare books, also our duplicate copies and some special non-book items. Um, we have about 250,000 books in here, and if we have enough copies, we sell them back out to readers, and they're also available online. We keep this vault at about 62 degrees to protect the books, and um, we're so excited to show you around. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the rare book section of the Book Vault at the Yiddish Book Center. 
at the book center we tend to try to keep at least three of each book that we get in anything above that we can sell back to the public get them back in circulation back to readers um, but there are some books that we don't even have three copies of and we may only have one copy that's where the rare book section comes in so this shelf and the shelf next to me make that section up and there are a couple ways that we usually determine if something is rare or that will tip us off if something is rare when we get books donated to us the first thing that we look for is where it was published. If it was published somewhere like New York or like Warsaw, where there were extremely like large, prolific Yiddish publishing houses, it tends to not be as rare um, because they were published more in mass quantity, as opposed to some place like Berlin or Lodz or Chicago that had smaller, short-lived, comparatively short-lived Yiddish public like Yiddish publishing histories. The second thing is time period. If something is kind of before the 1900s or immediately post-war um, and published in Eastern Europe. Those tend to be more rare. Um, we tend to not have as many copies of those. Uh, and then the last thing that we look at is genre. Um, there are books that are kind of like what we would think of as kind of like airport <laughs> pulp novels that uh, didn't, they were printed really cheaply. They weren't really meant to survive. Um, those tend to be rare just because they were, they were printed on cheap paper that didn't make it. Things like cookbooks that were used really frequently and kind of battered tend to be rare because they didn't survive. Things that are printed expensively on the other end of the spectrum also can be rare um, because it was so expensive to print them, like really nice art books, really nice kind of illustrated pieces that they only printed small runs because of how expensive it was to print. So the first book from the rare section that I'm going to show you is called Herta Meise by Wolf Tambor. And this book was published in Bucharest in 1985, so it's a great example of a Yiddish press that was more small and short-lived, which makes his books um, a little bit rarer. And it just has a great graphic design, great cover, um, and is a great example of something we look for in a rare book. The second book that I'm going to show you is one of my personal favorites. Um, it's a copy of Gauchos which is a book that was actually translated from Spanish into Yiddish. And if you look at the back cover, you can see the Spanish with the original author and translator. Um, and it's a really great example of books that were translated, um, of a book that was translated from another language. We have books from Spanish, from English, from Russian, from Polish. This one is specifically from Buenos Aires in 1925. I'd love to show you our typewriter collection. These typewriters were all used to type in Yiddish, but we'll talk about later how some of them were originally made to be Hebrew typewriters. Um, we have many different typewriters, some from published Yiddish authors donated by their children. For example, number 27, this is Bloomer Lempel's typewriter. Number 38, this is Kava Rosenkarp's typewriter. And then number 39, which was just donated, is Malka Haifetz Tristan's typewriter. These are fascinating examples of the modernization of Yiddish, and I like to think about different technological advancements and how that influenced Yiddish literature. For example, when typewriters became more portable, did that change what people wrote? Um, lots of questions to be had when looking at our Yiddish typewriters. Here we have two typewriters, one owned by Hava Rosenfarb and one owned by Bluma Lempel. And these are a fascinating way to see the differences between the Hebrew and Yiddish languages. So Bluma Lempel's typewriter was made originally to be a Yiddish typewriter. And we see here that we have the double letters. We have a double vav, sve vavin, and double yud, sve yudin. And that is because Yiddish uses this uh, double letter combination quite frequently. And it's very convenient when using a Yiddish typewriter to have these letters together. However, if you're typing with a Hebrew typewriter, you do not have those double letters provided and you would just have to type them twice when typing in Yiddish. We also see on this Yiddish typewriter that it has a Stumer Aleph, a silent Aleph, and a Kometz Aleph, the O sound, um, separately, which is quite convenient, again, when you're typing with Yiddish diacriticals. However, the Hebrew typewriter only has one Aleph, and it doesn't have any of the diacritical marks that are often used in Yiddish. If you're typing with a Hebrew typewriter, you can either omit these diacritical marks or add them later, um, but it's quite handy to be able to type in Yiddish with a Yiddish typewriter. One of the other forms of literature that we have at the Yiddish Book Center are Yiddish journals. Um, this is the back wall of the vault where all of our Yiddish journals live. Uh, a Yiddish journal functioned kind of like a magazine where people would have subscriptions and they would get the journal monthly, weekly, annually. Um, it depended on the journal. They covered everything from politics to art to literature to health, um, health and wellness, um, and were a really important part of 
local Jewish communities um, and how they would engage with each other um, through literature and politics. Um, here you can see we have started the process of uh, reorganizing and cataloging all of our journals to hopefully be accessible to readers in the future who are interested in research or literature um, because they were often a great way for like newer writers or less known writers um, to be published without having to publish a whole book. This is an example of uh, a particularly important journal. It's from a DP camp, a displaced persons camp um, after the Holocaust uh, in Germany. It's called From Lusten Horben, which means from uh, the last extermination. Uh, DP camp journals in particular were important um, in establishing some kind of Jewish autonomy in these DP camps after the Holocaust and after World War II that, uh, that told the Jewish community about things like the community theater and things like what's going on in the Jewish school and also served a political purpose in advocating for things like access to kosher food, access to a mikveh, um, the ability to determine their own forms of education and their own religious services um, within these kind of military run DP camps. Uh, <laughs> this is our religious book section uh, in the vault. We're going to get into some of these books more specifically later in the video, but for now I'm just going to go over a general overview of some of the kinds of religious literature that existed uh, in Yiddish. We have, first of all, just direct translations from the original language into Yiddish. We have collections of commentaries where there's the original text and then a Yiddish commentary where you may be more familiar with an English commentary um, that also existed in Yiddish. And then we have books that were originally written in Yiddish. And we'll see examples of all of those later in the video uh, when we sit down to talk about religious books specifically. Here we have an example of a Sena Rena. Sena Rena is a biblical quote, which means go forth and see. And it's often thought of as the women's Bible translated into Yiddish. However, it's not an exact translation. It's more of a compilation of different explanations and summaries of each weekly portion of the Torah. Um, this is a beautiful example that was printed in New York. The Santa Rena was first published in about the 1500s and it's gone through many editions since then, being an important part of Jewish homes and of Jewish women's spirituality. Here we have an example of a book of Tchines. This one was published in New York in 1916. A tichina is a supplemental personal supplication, a paraliturgical writing that was made often by women for women to pray over often domestic um, concerns, such as giving birth, um, prayer for a husband when he's away, and also Jewish traditions like lighting Shabbat candles, and sometimes also more spiritual um, worries such as demons and things like that. Um, and they're a fascinating example of women's personal um, concerns and, and spiritual needs, um, and also kind of reflect the societal expectations for women as a whole. This is an example of an important book um, for everyday life um, in kind of Yiddish religious life. It is uh, Yiddish Sidor. And you can see if I go to a later page that it has the original text, and then in the smaller text it has a, a Yiddish translation. This was published by a Hebrew publishing company as part of a set, and the rest of the set is actually five maxarim. I have one of the five maxarim here to show you, and you can see that this one is for uh, Yom Kippur. Here we have an example of a Tanakh translated into Yiddish. This is by the Yiddish poet and translator Yehoash, and depending on, depending on who you ask, his translation is either very holy or very blasphemous. You see that it has this beautiful char blot on the first page. And then when you open it, it has the Hebrew on one side and then the Yiddish, his Yiddish translation on the other side. So if you couldn't read Hebrew or just read Yiddish better, you could understand what was being written. So this is an example of a volume of the Mishnah in Yiddish. And you can see on the title page, it has the, the title in Hebrew. And this was published in Warsaw and we don't know an exact date of publication, but we can tell um, by the Cyrillic here that it was published before 1917. There's the use of some letters that were discontinued after the Russian Revolution. And if we open it, we can see that it's laid out with the original text at the top and then kind of a Yiddish commentary down at the bottom here. So here we have a, an example of a Haggadah in Yiddish. This one was published in 1956 by the Arbiter Ring, the Worker Circle. And this includes different songs and readings in Yiddish related to Passover, but also to social justice. 
The third Seder is a fascinating ritual created by Yiddishists, where after you did the first two Seders with your family in kind of a religious and ritual sense, perhaps, um, the third Seder you would gather with your Yiddishist friends um, and sing songs with religious elements, but it was more about culture and the Yiddish language. In addition to all the books that we just showed you, we have plenty more uh, in y religious books in Yiddish. Here we have some brief examples, a commentary of the fathers, the Shulchan Aruch, we have a translation of Psalms, uh, Midrash, and we even have a copy of Ein Yaakov that's more contemporary, um, and an example of books that are still being published and used mainly by the Hasidic communities in New York. Uh, and you can see from this, from the books we showed you and from all the other religious books we have in the center, that Yiddish has been and still continues to be a very important part of Jewish religious life. Here we are in the Yisker Bicher section. Yisker is a Yiddish word of Hebraic origin that has to do with remembering. Remembering. So these are memorial books that honor the memory of different Jewish towns, primarily in Eastern Europe. Um, and they are all here, and they are all digitized on our website, which we did recently in collaboration with the National or with the New York Public Library. Here I have an example from um, Bialystok, 1982, which is later for Yisker books. Um, and you can see it's bilingual and on the inside as well. Um, and that's to say that this is the only genre we officially collect in every language. Um, we have some Yisker books in Hebrew and Polish and other languages, but primarily in Yiddish. And these are really fascinating examples of public history. They are mostly published by Landsmannschaft groups and other groups of people that were survivors and came together um, and each wrote different chapters and published this book by themselves. So they're written kind of by everyday people for everyday people. They're fascinating examples of life in Eastern Europe. There's often pictures and maps drawn by hand of people remembering their towns. Um, and they're also um, really incredible resources for genealogical research. Hi, everyone. Okay, so that was Sarah and Emily's tour of the vault, which gives you a, an overview of the kinds of books that we collect and why they're important to us and why we do what we do. And uh, now we're going to move into the section where we talk about Yiddish language itself. Um, because I found giving these tours that people have a lot of questions and there's a lot of stuff that comes up. And so I'm just going to take you on a really short journey through um, like a history of the Yiddish language on one foot, basically. So what is Yiddish? Yiddish is the language of Ashkenazi Jews. So Jews that lived in Central and Eastern Europe. It's a language of everyday life, of vernacular and later became a major Jewish literary language. What does Yiddish sound like? Well, this is how you say, how are you, or what's up in Yiddish. This is nai, wie geht es, was machst du, was macht ihr, was hat sich? Sound familiar? What does Yiddish look like? Well, as Sarah talked about in the video about Yiddish typewriters, um, Yiddish uses um, different marks to represent um, vowels and different letters to represent vowels in a totally different system than Hebrew. So in Hebrew, you might have to guess if you don't see vowels written under a word as to what the word is, but in Yiddish, if the, the vowels are more likely to be built into the word itself or added um, through um, aspects of different letters such as patach aleph, komets aleph, Etc. So here in the above word, you have base, komets aleph, base, and that's a komets down underneath the aleph. And this word is bov, bean. So Yiddish is like English, it's really phonetic uh, once you understand um, and be able to decode and parse it out. Um, and it's even in much easier than English because um, it's just much more straightforward unless you're looking at a um, a loan word or a, a word from Aramaic or something, you can usually figure out exactly what the word is, how to pronounce it, um, and what it might mean. Where did Yiddish come from? Well, well, scholars like to debate that, um, but essentially there were Jews that were living in Southern Europe, France and Italy, um, in the Southern halves of France and Italy. Um, they probably came from North Africa and uh, they'd been there well through the, the spread of 
of the Roman Empire and early Christianity. And then they moved into the German speaking lands. They were invited into the Rhine River Valley area um, around the towns of uh, Mainz, Worms, and Speyer, which created the acronym SHUM. Um, and that's the, a, what they call the cradle of Ashkenazi civilization, um, where Yiddish was founded and which also led to a lot of um, flourishing of um, Ashkenazi rule of law, um, halacha um, in the in those communities. And from there, after developing a sort of um, basis of Hebrew, Aramaic, Romance languages, and German, uh, Ashkenaz too, Yiddish moved into what was then the uh, Poland-Lithuanian Commonwealth. And Jews were invited into that area um, to take on a, a middle economic role between the uh, nobles who were running the royal towns and the feudal serfs. And so Jews could, could help run those towns for the nobles um, and run inns and do all kinds of other sort of tertiary economic roles. Um, and so Jews established themselves in what was the land of Poland. And that's how Yiddish took on a Slavic element. And once the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth was dismantled by the um, end of the 1800s, sorry, 1700s, um, the Yiddish speakers uh, were located in what was then called the Pale of Settlement of the Russian Empire. Pale is just a, from the Latin word for fence. And so it just means this borderland, uh, Western borderland of the Russian Empire um, where Jews were encouraged to settle. Um, Jews couldn't live in Moscow or the other big cities, um, partially because if they lived in this uh, multicultural, multilingual uh, border empire alongside um, Ukrainians and Belarusians and Ruthenians, um, that that would be the first line of attack if Russia was um, invaded. What other languages did Yiddish speakers speak? So you'll never find a person who only speaks Yiddish, who's a monolingual Yiddish speaker. Uh, Yiddish speakers, by definition, are part of a um, cultural and linguistic poly system. So there's always other languages that they're in relationship to. Um, so obviously in, internally, culturally, religiously, that means Hebrew and Aramaic as the language of religion and halacha, uh, Jewish law. And then outside uh, the co-territorial languages that we have, you know, usually Russian, Polish, Ukrainian, et cetera. So it would be very common if you pulled any Jew off the street um, in uh, 1900 that they would speak four or five different languages or have knowledge of those languages. So here's a sentence um, that is an example of how the different uh, loan elements make up Yiddish. So the sentence is, de babe mach cholent af Shabbos. And here you have the uh, first example, the purple word is babe or grandmother. So that's a Slavic word, macht. The German element, Cholent, which is this romance word. Um, and so Cholent is probably uh, a word that is made up of two French words, show and long. So show for hot and long for slow. And if you've ever had Cholent, it's a dish made up of, uh, you know, meat, potatoes, eggs, barley, vegetables, and it's a Shabbos food. So you put it in the pot um, before Shabbos and it cooks and it cooks slowly overnight, and then by um, Shabbos after shul, after synagogue, um, lunchtime, you have a hot stew. So that's where the word cholent comes from. It's from the early romance influence on Yiddish. And then we have the word Shabbos, which of course in Hebrew is Shabbat. And so you, there you have the, the Hebrew influence on Yiddish. And here is an example of the first Yiddish newspaper. So I mentioned that uh, Yiddish became a literary language fairly late in its life. Um, so we know people were speaking Yiddish by probably around 1100. Um, the Jewish scholar Rashi had some knowledge of Yiddish. Um, and then we have the first uh, examples of written Yiddish um, in the mid 1200s. And, uh, but Yiddish was used you know, it was a vernacular, it was language of everyday life. So there wasn't a lot of call for publishing um, Yiddish manuscripts, certainly not in the pre-printing press era. 
um, after the Gutenberg revolution, um, there were Yiddish books published, but they were mostly, um, as the fellows mentioned in the videos, they're mostly religious books. So Yiddish was the translation language from the Hebrew for people who were not learned in Hebrew. And then once you get changes in the Russian empire um, in the mid 1800s, you get the first Yiddish newspapers, you get the first Yiddish libraries, you get a whole flowering of Yiddish literature and theater and literary culture that pops up all at once and is a high becomes a high modernist uh, literary language for the next uh, 60 or so years. So here's an example of a Yiddish election poster for the Jewish Socialist Party, the Bund, in Ukraine in 1917. Um, so it's saying, uh, Dort is unser Land. This is our land. Vote for the Bund. So this is this is an example of a Yiddish uh, political party that was that was diasporist as opposed to Zionist. So this is Jewish nationalism of the diaspora that says. Um, here, this is where your the people live. The Yiddish people are of this land, and so we will participate in this political system. And here's the part where we talk about Yiddish dialects. So some people will look at this food in front of us and say, "Oh, that's a noodle kugel," and some people will say, "No, no, no, it's a noodle kegel." So what's the difference between kegel or kugel? Uh, it's not a culinary difference; it's the difference of dialect. So what they call a uh, southern uh, Yiddish um, is from from Poland really down to uh, Romania. Um, you would say kegel, or you would say uh, zugen as opposed to zugen. Only in northern Yiddish, which is like Lithuania and Russia, would you say zugen? And this maps onto the the, the culinary map of Eastern Europe, um, not only in terms of kegel versus kugel, but in terms of sweet versus salty gefilte fish. And this also maps religiously onto whether people are Hasidic, like Polish Jews, or Misnagdish, which is Lithuanian Jews. Um, and so you can tell a lot about someone whether they like sweet or salty gefilte fish or whether they say kegel or kugel. What happened to Yiddish speakers during the Holocaust? The majority of the world's Yiddish speakers were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, survivors after the war, a small amount stayed in Poland, um, some remained in Soviet Russia, a very large number went to Israel, um, and some that were living in displaced persons camps in, in Central Europe, um, then went to the United States, Canada, Argentina, South Africa, and Australia. So actually after Israel, the largest number of displaced persons and survivors after the Holocaust went to Australia. And I'm gonna skip ahead to this picture because this is a Jewish day school um, in Melbourne. So this is a picture from the New York Times um, from this year. And it's showing that Yiddish is still spoken and taught um, as a language of everyday life at this Jewish school in Melbourne. And it, Yiddish is still spoken um, in non-religious communities as a spoken language. In many places, it's a heritage language. It's a language that people like myself learned in college and then began to speak with family members um, both in terms of grandparents, great-grandparents, and children. Um, and so today to get a, an example, uh, an estimate of how many Yiddish speakers there are in the world, it's hard to say because Yiddish is a, a lesser spoken language, but it's not an endangered language. So it still exists in many multiple forms. Um, so here you go. If you go to the um, Hasidic communities in Brooklyn, for example, um, you can go to a Yiddish bookstore, you can buy children's books, you can buy a daily Yiddish newspaper, you can buy graphic novels, spy novels, romance novels in Yiddish. Um, recently, the New York Times uh, published an expose on the lack of education in New York uh, Hasidic high schools, yeshivas, and they published that article in modern contemporary Hasidic Yiddish. So actual uh, students of these schools who had not learned uh, very good English could actually read the article and understand it. And today you can listen to Yiddish podcasts. There's an incredible world of Yiddish music to explore and you can learn Yiddish on your phone. You can download the Yiddish app on the for Duolingo, uh, which is a language learning app. And, uh, and you can learn to speak very fluent contemporary Yiddish using this app. And you can also come to the Yiddish Books Book Center either in person or online. We're just thrilled to, ha to have people come visit us. 
Um, so our next big adventure is the opening of our new core exhibit, Yiddish, a Global Culture, on October 15th. So we're going to have a huge party um, in Western Massachusetts for that. Um, and then we'll be able to roll that out digitally as well in various aspects. Um, something that I'm very excited about, as I mentioned earlier, is our online courses that are taught in English, all English readings uh, for a general audience, uh, anyone who's interested in Yiddish culture. And so our next course begins October 11th, and it's be called Between Heaven and Earth, Yiddish Women's Folklore, Rituals, and Magic. So that's a good uh, course for this time of year um, between Yom Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you go visit the ancestors in cemeteries and, uh, and pr practice in the shuttle was that you would take a candle wick and measure the graves of your ancestors and then make a candle um, with the wick and then use that in your um, part of your prayer practice. So that's the end of my presentation for today, but I'm going to stick around and answer all of your questions and uh, and have a bit of a discussion if anyone has anything that they'd like to share. So in Yiddish, we say, Zeit gesinnt, Zeit gesinnt und stark, a guten bis später, and this time of year, we say, a guten quittel. Well, thank you for that presentation. Um, we don't have any questions yet, so if you have any kind of question or comment, please submit it through the Q&A. Um, one thing that I found very um, interesting when I came to visit the center that wasn't in the slideshow was the oral history work hmm. that you guys do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. The oral history project at the Yiddish Book Center is a huge initiative. Um, where oral histories um, have been collected um, from Yiddish speakers and from just anyone who, whose, life, whose lives have been touched by Yiddish. Um, teachers, students, um, people who learned Yiddish from their grandparents. And um, our, our oral history director, uh, Krista Whitney, has trained um, just hundreds of, of young people um, and all over the world to collect oral histories. Um, and they're part of this huge di digital archive. Um, and so we use those in our educational programs and they're part of our core exhibits. And um, we think, you know, for a, for a culture that was oral primarily for about a thousand years, um, collecting oral histories is a really important way to understand the impact of Yiddish on the world. Mm -hmm. And it also kind of ties back in with what Aaron was talking about in the documentary how it's just um, telling stories is just such a big part of our culture. Um, Sue asks, how many different dialects of Yiddish are there? That's a great question. So the main dialects are, as I mentioned, kind of Southern or Northern, um, but you can break those up into, into different sections as well. Um, so there's like Polish Yiddish versus uh, Ukrainian or Romanian Yiddish, sort of one family, and then Lithuanian um, and Russian Yiddish are like one major family. But within that, um, you have dialects like the, the Vilna dialect, um, which people call Sabbath Losen, because in this very specific dialect, they don't say the sh in Shabbos, they say Sabbos. So that's kind of an unusual one that, that sticks out. Um, and then there's Western Yiddish, which um, most people don't speak anymore, but was more in the Central Europe and uh, in the Netherlands, um, which became lesser common by the 1900s, early 1900s. Um, and then there's all the sort of the Hungarian Yiddish is now the, um, which is related to Ukrainian Yiddish and Polish Yiddish is now the most common uh, version of uh, within the Hasidic communities. Um, so when the Yiddish Duolingo app was being created, there was a big debate over like what dialect of Yiddish would be used for Duolingo. And they chose the most common version of modern Hasidic Yiddish, which was a really interesting choice because um, people like myself, when I learned Yiddish in college, um, we use what they call YIVO standard Yiddish, which was developed by the YIVO Institute, which was the, the big institute of, of Yiddish language that was founded in Poland in 1925. And, uh, and so it was sort of like the Académie Française. So it was like a, a standardized Yiddish that was not a vernacular. No one actually spoke it um, unless they learned it like that in school. Um, but, you know, if you don't have people to learn Yiddish from, 
um, in your own families or your own communities, then it's okay. It's okay to speak standardized Yiddish. Um, and, uh, and so you can find all of those different dialects still existing today. Um, Gail asks, do you accept oral histories that are in English? How does a person submit that? So yeah, a lot, most of our oral, oral histories are in languages other than Yiddish. Some are in Yiddish, um, but some are in Hebrew. And our oral history director, Krista, was just in uh, Brazil. So I imagine she got some oral histories in Portuguese. Um, and to submit an oral history, um, usually they're done through collections. So an oral historian from the Yiddish Book Center project will come to a community and will solicit oral histories. Um, but if you volunteer to do one that's great and you just um contact the yiddish book center oral history program and they'll put you in touch with the right person i remember when we went to visit krista um said her someone i don't know if it was even me i said what was your favorite oral history that you ever took and she said she went to leonard nimoy's house and spoke Aww. to him and that was the coolest one she ever did so um <laughs> Janet asked, does the center have any role in preserving Yiddish films? No, <laughs> mm. because there is the Center for Yiddish Film, which is housed at Brandeis University. And so we work with them to show films, um, especially during some of our online classes, we have film screenings. Um, but uh, yeah, there's already a place for that. It's the National Center for Jewish Film, and they do a really amazing job of preserving Jewish film. Over. Oh, one more spot. Okay. Carolyn asks, would you share some examples of words that many of us use regularly and yet have no idea that they are Yiddish? Example, schlep. Yep. Schlep is a is a good example of, of a Yiddish word. Um it it doesn't come up that often as much as you would think when you're actually speaking Yiddish. Um, but um, it usually comes up idiomatically in expressions like um, schleppen de, 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 go, de golas, like schlepping the exile. Um, it's, a, it's a long slogging journey. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was just talking with some kids. Um, we were talking about the word gelt, um, which is the word for money, um, which kids mostly think of when they think of Hanukkah gelt and chocolate candy. Um, and relations to the dreidel. Um, so one of the things we're working on for our Hanukkah curriculum is talking about the letters on the dreidel, which most people don't associate with Yiddish, um, but it's a it's a game that goes back in um, Yiddish history for quite a long time. And so the, the letters on the dreidel all represent Yiddish words. Um. Okay, unless anyone has any other questions, I think we'll wrap up a little bit after eight. Um, I just wanted to also plug um, Aaron Lansky, the founder who was narrating the video at the beginning, also wrote a book um, about the story of the Yiddish Book Center. It's called Outwitting History, and we have a copy at the library. Um, and then I also saw that Mango Languages, which is our free language learning app through the libraries libraries um also has yiddish i don't know which type of yiddish it is so <laughs> i'd have to look into that but if you're interested in learning um we also have it through the library for free That's um great. yeah and just again if you're interested in more programming especially the book discussions um that are the major part of this grant and of the series, um, visit our website and register or call us and register. Um, we just really want a lot of participation in this because it's just such an amazing opportunity for our library. Um, we're the only library in the state that was awarded the grant and there were only 27 other libraries in the whole country who were awarded the grant this year. So it's really special opportunity for us. So um, take advantage. But thank you, um, Jennifer, for generously giving us your time and expertise and Thank knowledge. Um, oh, we yeah. all really appreciate it. And we didn't have to, you know, get on a plane and travel, but it is beautiful. I will um, concur. So if you ever are out in that area, make a trip over there. Cause it is even in the middle of winter, it was beautiful and gorgeous and yeah, very special. So 
thank you very much. And I hope everyone has a great evening and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye.